Hey gang, it's Robey Plant. Today I show you how to make a simple scotch mash. So let's go. So if you watch my channel for a while, you've seen I've done a few videos on creating mashes and washes for uh, certain distilled products. Um, spirits like vodka, rum, scotch, tequila, whatever, are produced in a two-part process. The part that everybody thinks about is the distillation part, but before you get to that, you have to have a fermented part. Uh, because I homebrew, because I make mead, wine, cider, uh, I know a decent amount about the first part of the process. So I've done some videos in the past because people have inquired me about the whole distillation thing. I don't cover that topic uh, for legal and other purposes uh, as far as actual distillation. But again, the first part of the process, I feel like I can uh, discuss a little bit. And I've done a few videos on the topic. I have a corn mash series you could check out. I've done a rum wash video, a tequila wash video. Uh, recently did a simple bourbon mash video. So today I thought we would try scotch. Uh, scotch is a logical progression for home brewers because, like beer, it's barley based. Uh, technically, uh, scotch is made from malted barley. You can use some unmalted barley too, produced in Scotland. There's some other rules um, for how it's made, but basically it's a barley-based whiskey. Where scotch is a little different than some barley whiskeys that we have here in the U.S. Here in the U.S. you'll have rye whiskeys, wheat whiskeys, corn whiskeys, and technically there are barley whiskeys out there even though there's not a lot where the American barley whiskey is slight is different than the scotch whiskey is the smokiness and the peatiness and I'm going to show you that today how we get there we get there from the use of uh, what brewers would call specialty grains if you've seen in my brewing videos especially the kits you know the base is generally malt extract uh, they take these grains and they basically cook them and they'll extract the sugars out and they turn it into powder. And so now we've got those delicious sugars from the barley, but we don't have to go through the mashing process ourselves. This saves time and makes your life easier. But this is just kind of the base. Sometimes you want some different flavors to add something to it. In home brewing, it's those specialty grains. Uh, you use those a lot of time to add color, but the darker grains like your coffee malts or whatever will, will add certain flavors to your beer. That's why we have this. This is a pound of Beechwood smoke malt. That's gonna give us the smokiness that you get, help give us the smokiness you get in a lot of scotches. Uh, a lot of your homebrew supply shops sell this. They also sell a peated uh, malt. You can use that. Uh, kind of a personal preference thing. Um, I didn't want to get something too peaty, but I like a little smoke in my uh, scotch, so we went with that. Um, real quick, let me explain to you the process of coming up with this recipe, because if you're getting into this, if uh, and again, legal disclaimer, distillation is legal in most places, don't do it, save the children. But if you're in a jurisdiction where you can pull this off, uh, let me explain a little bit of the back end of the recipe. Uh, unlike beers where you're trying to make a beer and you're going to use a grain bill that gets you to that flavor profile, it'll also get you to a, a certain ABV level. The ABV level is a bigger deal when making these mashes because, again, the eventual point of the project is to distill and extract all that alcohol out through distillation and you want plenty of it. Um, quickly talk about considerations. Uh, if, if we were doing this in a commercial sense, it's very important that we get a higher ABV mash because turning that still on costs us time and money. So we want to make sure it's worth our time and money. Uh, even to the home distiller, I would say it's kind of pointless to create whatever kind of mash you want to if the, the you know the ABV of it's five percent or less it's just really kind of a waste of time so you want to construct your recipe to where you're up at least eight percent or higher in the distillery uh, world you're in the teens generally but uh, for our purposes because I didn't want to try a too uh, 
too high of ABV mash. I didn't want to worry about things like stuck fermentation or whatever. I went with a little lower ABV version, but I'll, I'll tell you how I got there, where we're going. So what I have here is seven pounds of dried malt extract and one pound of our specialty grains. One pound of dried malt extract in one gallon of water gives you 42 gravity points or a starting gravity of 1.042. So I've got seven pounds of this and then I got one pound of our specialty grains. Generally, now everybody's efficiency in mashing is a little different. Again, that's why a lot of times you'll just skip to this because it makes your life easier because you're not worried about efficiency as much. But generally, we're going to get 28 gravity points from this one pound bag of uh, malt. So seven pounds and 42 gravity points, and one pound, 28 gravity points. Our projected starting gravity is going to be somewhere around 1064, uh, probably anywhere from the 1060 range to the 1065 range. That, if it ferments out to a final gravity of 1.00, should get around 8.4% alcohol by volume, which is a nice little spot. It's it's enough alcohol that if we were to distill this, it'd be worth our time. Uh, but again, I'm not worried about doing too big of a mash or you know getting a stuck fermentation. So with that being said, let's make a simple scotch mash. Alright, so before we get started, I want to show a technique uh, just in case you have this dilemma. If you get these specialty grains, a lot of people, especially if you order them online, they're not going to come crushed or uh, gr grinded. If you don't have a grinder at home, if you don't have access to one, or again, your local brew shop, sometimes they don't, they can't do it for you or whatever. You, I'm gonna show you a little simple technique that will still get the job done. You'll drop efficiency a little bit, but it'll help you out. I just take a rolling pin. I have, I have our one pound of smoke malt in this bag, and I'm just gonna take a rolling pin, and we're just gonna crack those grains. Uh, again, in a perfect world, you would like a nice, nice grind or cr crush but you don't want to make it into flour. Uh, but this right here still will crack the grains enough that we get that water inside, it gets to activating that starch, turning into sugar, we will be able to extract those sugars from this by just cracking this. So this is a pretty simple method. You know, just take this rolling pin. This is only good if, you know, like in our special situation, we have a little bit of specialty grain. Uh, I would not want to do 10 pounds of this for a full, you know, beer. You know, five gallons of beer, what have you. Uh, that probably wouldn't work. But for a small amount of grain, if you're used, ever using specialty grains, this is a option to go ahead and crack it and be able to use the grains. So let me get this done, and then we'll come back to uh, start our mash. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we've got our crushed grains. I put it in uh, what's called a muzzling bag. Basically, this is a glorified tea bag. But I put our cracked grains in there. I've heated up two gallons of water to roughly 150 to 155 degrees, somewhere in that range. And we're just going to let, we're going to dunk this real quick. All right. And we're going to let this sit for roughly about 30 minutes. You want to maintain that temperature between 150 and 155. And what goes on at that temperature is it kicks off enzymes inside barley to start converting those starches into sugar and it's that sugar that we need so we're going to let this sit for about 30 minutes and again between 150 155 degrees we're going to extract uh, those sugars but also that smokiness out of the grain and then we will after that we'll go ahead take the grains out and then we'll bring this to a boil and then we'll come back to add our malt extract all right so it was it was 30 minutes, I took out the grains, I let them drain, and then I brought um, our water up to a boil. And then when I, I do that for sanitation purposes, and then when it comes to boil, you want to turn it off. You don't want to add this malt extract while it's boiling, or you'll get what's called a boil over, some home brewers have to deal with occasionally. So we'll go ahead and start adding our malt extract. Um, 
if we were going to do a beer, because this again basically glorified beer, after we add this malt extract, we bring to a boil and do our 60 minute boil, which is traditional with beer, but we're not going to do that with this. We're just going to add this malt extract, all seven pounds. And uh, once we do that, we're going to go ahead and uh, I have my fermenter, I've already, ster I've already uh, sanitized it. And we're going to add the two gallons of water to our fermenter and then add three gallons of cold water to bring it to the proper temperature. And uh, then we'll pitch our yeast. So let me go ahead and finish adding the malt extract and we'll come back well, when we pitch our yeast because I want to talk about yeast in the context of different types of yeast that can be used for uh, producing a mash or whatever for distillation. So let me get this finished and we'll come right back. Alright gang, so I took our uh, two gallons of our wash, beer, wort, whatever you want to use, put it in my fermenter, added three gallons of cold water to cool it off. Uh, I've still got a few degrees to go so I'm letting it sit right now. So I thought I'd take this time to talk to you a little bit about yeast and what type of yeast we'd use and what's the benefits of, of uh, each. Um, first and foremost, you can use any type of yeast except for nutritional yeast. I get some questions on that. The yeast cells in that are dead. So if you're, you know, at your local grocery store and in the health section saw this big jar of nutritional yeast at a decent price, sorry you can't use that. But every other type of yeast you can use. Uh, the first is kind of the most obvious and again one I get a lot of questions about. It's just regular bread yeast. This is a pack of Flashman's, Fleischmann's Active Dry Yeast. You can use this or Rapid Rise Yeast. Pretty much the same thing. Obviously Rapid Rise works a little faster, but not that big a difference. Um, this will work. You're not going to hit a real high ABV and the taste of the fermented product is not going to be that great. But this does work and this is what the moonshiners back now almost a hundred years ago would have used. There wasn't homebrew shops or whatever. Uh, this is what they would have used and you could use that still but it's definitely not the best. Uh, next off you could use a regular beer yeast. This came out of a, a kit I'd gotten a while back. Uh, this is measured as 11 grams. It's measured exactly for a five gallon batch. Uh, this will definitely work too. This will give you a better fermented product. This is uh, again designed a little more specifically for fermentation. Uh, the issue you run into this is if you do a high gravity brew, like I said, if I throw in another two, three pounds of malt extract, we would have been close to 1.100. That might be too much for these traditional, just kind of a generic beer yeast. But again, this would work too if you're, what I've got again is going to be in the 8% range. This would work for that. Um, if you wanted to go with the beer route, but you had a higher gravity brew, you could go with some of these high gravity uh, beer yeast. Uh, there's special yeast for like if you're making like an Imperial Russian stout or barley wine, something like that. And you can find these tubes um, either online or at your homebrew shop. Again, they're designed for a little higher gravity beer, but if you kind of like the taste, you know, that beer yeast produce, and want some, you know, that works a little higher level, this right there. Um, you can use, I um, believe this is a champagne yeast. Uh, you can use that. Actually, champagne yeast is probably one of the best routes to go because champagne and wine yeast, they work into the mid-teens as far as ABV wise. So they can handle a little more sugar. They're a little designed to handle higher ABV uh, environments. So that that's a positive uh, to that. And because you're distilling the slight difference in taste from a beer yeast to a wine yeast, it's not gonna come out as much uh, after distillation. Another yeast that's a possibility and I just happened to found this in my fridge. Um, if you a regular viewer of the channel, about a year or so ago, I did a batch of sake and I had some leftover uh, yeast for sake and it says sake and spirits yeast on there. Sake yeast can get to the low 20s as far as ABV. Uh, I believe in the video where I made the sake, I believe I was like an 18% range or whatever. But you can get to low 20s, high teens, low 20s with this sake yeast. Uh, it, it handles uh, 
a high alcohol environment quite well. Uh, the only thing about sake yeast is in the sake making process, use something called koji, a, a mold, and it, it works with that. I don't know uh, how this necessarily plays with grains, but again, as far as uh, ABV, hitting a higher ABV, uh, this definitely does the job. And last but not least, I want to talk about a product, and I've had this pack for a while, Turbo Yeast. Um, this is specifically designed for fermenting something to be distilled. You're going to get the highest ABV of any yeast out of this, and there's several variations on the Turbo Yeast. Uh, the, the Turbo Yeast, which I have here, also ferments faster. Both of these things are very big for the actual commercial distiller. You want to get as much alcohol out of that wash and you want to get that fermented as fast as possible. Time is money in their business and so this is specially designed for that. Um, they are coming in now smaller little packets for a five gallon batch. I want to say this is for like 30 plus gallons, something like that. Uh, one thing about turbo yeast, if you decide to go this route, if you have a homebrew shop or order this online, one thing unique about the turbo yeast is, turbo yeast also comes with yeast nutrients inside. One of the things with turbo yeast is you don't have to, and you don't want to, more importantly you don't want to, you don't need to do a yeast starter or rehydrate the yeast. Actually if you rehydrate turbo yeast, because of the nutrients and stuff, uh, when you just rehydrate with water, there's actually some chemicals in there that unless it's working in a mash, it could end up uh, hurting you or, or, or causing a bad reaction. Uh, you just sprinkle in the turbo yeast. Turbo yeast, you can also use it too. I get all questions all the time, you know, I'll make a wine or a bean, like how can I make it higher proof? How can I make it higher proof? I wanna make it as high as possible, you know, but obviously they won't and can't still. Turbo yeast can get you up to close to 25% alcohol by volume or 50 proof. Uh, you can pump your whatever mash, wine, or whatever with a ton of sugar and you can get to high ABV with this. However, the fermented product is not going to taste good. This is not for creating a fermented product, this is for creating a distilled product. But you have that, that option. Where I'm going to go, because I'm not going to distill this and uh, I just want to experiment with stuff. I, I don't record everything I make. I'm always making stuff, but a lot of it doesn't get recorded. I'm gonna make do a little experiment. I'm just gonna use a pack of Safe Ale, Saf Ale USO5 and generic ale yeast. Again, uh, this is good enough for this batch because we're shooting for the mid eights ABV wise, and this can handle that no problem. And this pack's you know perfect for a five gallon size. But I just wanted to touch real quickly on the types of yeast and the options you have for yeast when doing some kind of mash. Well, with that being said, let me get this cooled down and then we'll come back. I'll have our hydrometer reading and we'll wrap up. All right, so I got our mash cooled. I pitched the yeast and did a hydrometer reading. Uh, our hydrometer reading came out at around 1060, 1061. It was the lower end of our range, but we came out to about about where we were projecting. So we should hit a little over 8% alcohol by volume. Uh, real quick uh, to uh, go over the recipe, it was seven pounds of uh, light dried malt extract. Don't get too cute if you go to your local homebrew shop to get this malt with the different colors, you know, darker malts, what have you. Uh, just a generic light dry malt extract is fine. Again, we're just needing those sugars from the malted barley. Uh, to kick off fermentation. We did also add an additional pound of that beechwood smoke malt that gives the smokiness that we wanted to get. Again, classic scotch has that smokiness, that peatiness, and it's that smoke malt we added that uh, will provide that. Um, as far as modifications go, the only real modification in this recipe is if you wanted more smokiness or you want some peatiness, uh, we had a pound of the smoke malt, if you want to add a pound of the peat malt, or if you want to extra smoke, smoke malt, that's fine. But as far as trying to do anything with flavoring or you know adding any herbs, spices, whatever, kind of pointless at this point because, again, if this is to be done to eventually distill, you're going to strip a lot of that out. So if you wanted to add flavor, like you know nowadays all these flavored whiskeys have, have come about, and I've even done a, a video on making your own cinnamon whiskey. Um, you do that after distillation. Don't don't mess with before. Again, we're just wanting to get those barley sugars 
out to brew our mash to give us the alcohol that then would get distilled. So there's no need to uh, get crazy with this recipe. As far as what is next, uh, if you're doing this at home, about seven days it would be ready to distill. Uh, we're not another again another difference between just between doing a fermentation for something that gets distilled and then doing a fermentation that would be just the end product. Again, basically we have a glorified beer. If this was a beer, we would let this go for a couple of weeks and then bottle and let those bottles sit for a couple of weeks. It would be a month or so before we had our product. A uh, month to six weeks before we'd have our kind of finished product. With distillation, you're just wanting it to hit a certain point of alcohol and then, all right, time to throw in the still. Where, the, where this kind of comes in different is for beer, because this is going to be our finished product, we want it our best. And one of the things you have to do is let the fermentation go out a little bit longer, let the yeast kind of go through the complete cycle, and also sometimes the dead yeast that happens on the bottom will absorb certain flavors that happen during the fermentation process. And if you let that finish out, it, it can kind of smooth out the beer, uh, kind of balances the flavor a little more. You're not worried about that distillation, so all right, seven days, let's get that alcohol that we need, and then we're done. We're not worried about the flavor as much uh, because, again, distillation will, will take a lot of that out. Well, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Also, please like the video because it lets YouTube know we're putting out good content. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please leave them in the comment section, or you can always contact me on the Twitter page. Till next time, bottoms up.